Hello, and welcome back to the Sinobabble podcast. This is episode four in our series on the Cultural Revolution. In early 1968, Yang Shiguang, the student who had written the piece With a China on behalf of the Hunanese rebel group Shangwulian, wrote the following about the state of the Cultural Revolution. Quote, Social reforms were aborted, social changes were not consolidated and thoroughly realised, and the end of the great proletariat cultural revolution has not been reached. As the masses have said, everything remains the same after so much ado. Indeed, it seemed as though a lot had happened in a very short period of time, and yet when you really looked at the fabric of Chinese society and politics, it was hard to see what had really changed. I was thinking of the best way to describe this phenomenon when I came upon a good analogy while looking into a completely different topic. So I was recently listening to a podcast about the Russia-Ukraine situation. Um, If you're listening to this in the future and World War 3 has broken out as a result, I'm sorry if I sound really flippant. But anyway, the hosts were giving some background context discussing Ukrainian history and particularly one of the more recent leaders, I think it was Viktor Yanukovych, and one of the things that they said was that this man had gotten on the wrong side of the Ukrainian oligarchy because he was re-centralising corruption. Now, that phrase, the re-centralisation of corruption, really stuck with me because I was immediately like, aha, that phrase perfectly sums up what happened with the Cultural Revolution, at least in my mind. Mao had stated at the launch of the Cultural Revolution that the aim of it was to oust the capitalist raiders, decadent anti-party, anti-socialist bourgeois power holders, and feudal remnants within the party state. Many individuals were targeted as a result, but did these attacks amount to a revolution of the system itself? Were the capitalist raiders the cause of the corruption, or just a symbol, or a scapegoat, or a result of an inherently corrupt state? These are the key questions that we should keep in mind when we're talking about the Cultural Revolution, and that's the main thing that I want to be exploring in this episode. There are two major political events and a handful of skirmishes that characterise the period from late 1968 to 1972, which we can sort of label as a restoration of the party state. So in this episode, we're going to be discussing what the process was by which the re-centralisation of corruption, if you will, took place in China during the middle stages of the Cultural Revolution. In August 1968, an article was published in the People's Daily titled Unity of Wills, Unity of Steps and Unity of Actions. The article called for the entire revolutionary force of the country, the masses, the military and the cadres, to come together, end factionalism, and basically go back to doing what they were told. A quote from the article reads, Truth is in the hands of the proletarian headquarters, which it is terribly wrong not to worship. Every revolutionary fighter must resolutely obey and thoroughly carry out every order of Chairman Mao and the proletarian headquarters. Whether they fully understand or not, they must carry out the orders unconditionally. In the absence of full understanding, they must first carry out the order while striving to deepen their understanding. So basically what the article was trying to say was that the time for thinking for oneself was over. The time to start obeying the orders of the party, and in particular Mao, had begun. By this point, it was clear that the entrenched bureaucracy that the Cultural Revolution had originally intended to overthrow was going nowhere. Though some cadres went through the process of re-education at something called May 7 cadre schools, which was a fancy way of saying forced labour on a farm, the cadres were still the overwhelming majority of representatives of the new revolutionary committees. Though there was some mass representation on these committees, former government officials, new government officials and military personnel, guided by Mao Zedong thought, essentially ran the new government using the same structure as the old government. In a way, it made sense that the old system couldn't be completely overthrown. In terms of the cadres, the existing bureaucracy was simply too massive to undo without the entire state collapsing. There had been around 720,000 cadres and other functionaries in 1949, but this number had quadrupled to 3,310,000 just three years later. 
By 1957, the number of cadres had increased to 8.09 million, around 1.2% of the total population. By the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, this number had swelled again to 11.6 million. According to statistical data, the party state bureaucracy was the fastest growing employment sector. To quote one source, in Shanghai, for example, where total employment between 1949 and 1957 grew by only 1.2% and the number of factory workers grew by 5.8% every year, government staff increased at the much higher annual rate of 16%. From another perspective, by 1955, government cadres were eating up nearly 10% of the national budget, almost twice the 5% ceiling the national leadership had originally planned, and by the time of the Cultural Revolution decade, this figure had risen to 30%. So we can see that the cadre body running the government were an essential part not only of the political state functioning, but also in the fabric of society itself. We're talking about a lot of people here. As for the military, by 1968, it had become clear that Mao was entirely dependent on the PLA to support not only the party, but his own personal rule. In the summer of 1968, he stated that, quote, The army's prestige must be absolutely safeguarded. There can be no doubt whatsoever of that. The military was free from the constant critiques and violent attacks to which the cadre class were continually subjected during the Cultural Revolution. After all, the cadres were more replaceable. Although the initial stages of the Cultural Revolution had reduced the number of cadres to just 9.2 million in 1969, the downsize was short-lived. In fact, not only did the number of cadres bounce back, but it did so at a faster rate than ever before, as the Chinese officialdom nearly doubled from 9 million in 1969 to 17 million in 1973. The military was a less fluid organisation, however, and was prone to factionalism among provincial lines. Mao couldn't afford to upset the current balance and risk losing his muscle. It was probably because of this realisation that he overcompensated slightly by giving the army a lot of representation in the new revolutionary committees. Though the revolutionary committees had between 100 and 250 members, much like the actual Chinese Communist Party, Most of the power was concentrated in the hands of the standing committee, the majority of which, by this point, were military leaders. So in these new revolutionary committees, out of 23 standing committee chairmen, 13 were commanders, 5 were commissars, and a similar number were made vice chairmen. Not a single member of the mass organisations were elected to any of these top positions. So you could argue that the revolutionary committees were just a temporary structure and therefore it didn't really matter whether or not the masses had any sort of top representation, but that would be overlooking the fact that the revolutionary committees were supposed to be a transitional body. They were to be the next stage in the Cultural Revolution and also at this point it wasn't actually clear how long the Cultural Revolution was going to last, nor what the impact the committees would have on the post-Cultural Revolution world. So it would stand to reason that those who attained top positions now would be well placed to get good positions later. So why exactly was it that the masses and the mass organisations, the Red Guards, who had been so instrumental in the first stages of the Cultural Revolution, were now being left in the dust? One theory is that the Red Guards were unable to take part in the new system because of their negative role in the Cultural Revolution. One contemporary article, written by Juliana Heaslett in 1972, states the following. The Red Guards brought down all of the 29 provincial party committees. In addition, they played an important role in discrediting over 80% of the central committee. The strength of the Red Guards rested in their ability to destroy. Like many of the former political campaigns of the communist Chinese regime, the emphasis of the Red Guard movement was negative, against the established order, against the party, against the military. As a destructive force, the Red Guards were highly successful. However, once their negative objectives had been accomplished, the Red Guards proved themselves unable to act effectively along positive lines and thus extend the life of the Red Guard movement. So, in other words, even in the 1970s, 
People recognised that the Red Guards were just tools used by the political elite to achieve the major goal of reforming the system. Except it wasn't so much a reform as it was maybe a reboot. Perhaps this is why so many students and other members of the masses became so disillusioned after this point. Their spirits were effectively crushed, and some politically disenchanted students created the slogan Indolence is Justified, a pun on Mao's slogan Rebellion is Justified. But not all students and members of the masses lost their political zeal. At the end of the same article, the author adds, quote, The second theme which characterises former Red Guard thinking is a demand for an active political role in the Chinese political system. This revolutionary experience of the Red Guards may prove bitter to the future of Chinese leaders. China's future leaders will be forced to contend with a sophisticated generation of young people who have been practically schooled in political infighting and can be expected to be keenly interested in the Chinese political scene. Thus, like their non-communist counterparts throughout the world, the youth of China will demand a larger role in determining the course of China's future history. Now, if that isn't a bit of foreshadowing, I don't know what is. But as it stands, we are a long way away from 1989. So, the pieces for the creation of a new state in the wake of the Cultural Revolution were all put in place. The question now was, what did Mao and the other leaders envision the new China to look like? Mao decided to hold another party congress to address just this issue, and tasked Jiang Chunqiao and Yao Wenyuan with coming up with a report that would outline the basic steps for the reconstruction of the party. Yao Wenyuan suggested that the party be rebuilt from the top down, with a new constitution and then new party committees formed at each level provincial, county, township, and commune. These new committees would have representatives from each of the important groups in society, the masses, the army, and the party. Seemingly happy with the proposal, the party adopted all of these ideas and added the caveat that a special provision be added naming Lin Biao as Mao's official successor, something that was never done for his previous successor, Liu Xiaoqi, who was about to be kicked out of the party. So, in order to flesh out all of these proposals that Yao had come up with, Mao called a party plenum, which was held with the central committee members who had survived the purging, as well as non-members whose star had risen during the tumultuous period of the Cultural Revolution, and also members of the Cultural Revolution group and the relevant PLA leaders. So, these were all the major actors in the Cultural Revolution, and they all gathered together for the 12th plenum of the Central Committee of the Party, which was held from the 13th to the 31st of October 1968. One major event that happened at this plenum was that Lim Biao made a speech, again condemning the so-called May 16th clique, the leaders of the party who had dared to speak out against the Cultural Revolution and Mao, which we talked about in the last episode, where all of these leaders had gathered together to basically call the whole Cultural Revolution a mistake. It seems like a lot of people had actually attended this plenum just to spectate and hope that other leading members of the party would be kicked out for good, probably so that their job positions could open up and maybe they could swoop in and take them. But alas, apart from the dismissal of Liu Xiaoqi, which I'll talk about in a second, there were no major purges. Deng Xiaoping was dropped from the Central Committee, but he seems to have been protected more generally by Mao, and he wasn't kicked out of the party entirely, which I'm sure a lot of people were hoping for. Apart from this minor action, the rest of the plenum was just dedicated to Mao endorsing the actions of the Central Cultural Revolutionary Group and the military as important and correct, and then announcing the adoption of the new constitution. It seems that apart from getting rid of literally the most important man in the Chinese government, after Mao, that is, the focus was on preparing for the reconstruction of the system. So I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent here to talk about Liu Xiaoqi and his history and his role within the party and the People's Republic until 1969. I feel like we haven't talked about Liu Xiaoqi a lot, especially considering how important he is, but there is actually a reason for that, 
I don't like talking about really important characters and giving you lots and lots of backstory about them until they actually become important. This is mainly to save you trying to remember and recall the entire life history of someone or having to jump back to like episode 20 just to try and remember some things I told you. So it's easier to just save it for either when they do something really important or when they die. Liu Xiaoqi was born in 1898 to a rich peasant family in Hunan province, near Changsha. He was actually born and raised quite close to where Mao lived, but the two apparently never met before they left the province. So Liu graduated from high school and then tried out a couple of different routes. He joined the military for a while and then he took German classes in Beijing with the intention to study in the West, but ended up settling on Russian which he studied in Shanghai, and then travelling to Moscow in 1920 to study there. He joined the CCP in 1921, after it had been founded, and then returned to China the next year to participate in labour activities in Guangzhou, Hubei and Shanghai. He seems to have moved up the ranks pretty quickly, although the party was quite small at this time. But in any case, he made Central Committee in 1927 and Standing Committee, or Politburo, in 1931. He was at the Jiangxi Soviet in the 1930s and joined the beginning of the Long March in 1934 when the Jiangxi Soviet had been besieged by Chiang Kai-shek. But he didn't go all the way to Yan'an immediately. He actually stayed behind in Guomingdang and Japanese-controlled areas to try and organise resistance movements with other leading members of the party, including Peng Zhen, who, if you remember from the first episode of The Cultural Revolution, was the mayor of Beijing whose purge was one of the triggers for the Cultural Revolution. Liu did eventually go to Yan'an in 1937, and from there we basically know the rest. He was an important member of the party leadership up to and after 1949. Liu had been married at least four times, although some sources put the number as high as six. I'm not really sure why, but if I had to guess, in China during this period there were a lot of um, betrothals between children, And it's possible that one or more of his wives died when they were um, sort of engaged or betrothed, but before they started having children, very, very young. So they were wives, but they didn't maybe consummate or have any children, or the marriage was very short. So Liu's first official wife was executed by the Guomingdang in the 1930s. His second marriage was very brief and childless and kind of mysterious. But his third marriage was more prominent because it ended in a bitter divorce, with the children of that marriage being the ones to denounce him during the Cultural Revolution. His fourth marriage was more successful. He married a woman called Wang Guangmei, a young, well-educated woman from a bourgeois family. She had a degree in physics and studied for her PhD in Stanford. She actually met Liu when she was acting as an interpreter for the Americans, helping the nationalists negotiate a truce with the communists in late 1940s, just at the age of 24. She and Liu apparently were very close and had a good relationship. They had four children together, and she often travelled with him for his diplomatic work, becoming well known for her role as the beautiful and articulate First Lady of China. But it was probably her closeness to Liu that meant that she too would end up caught in the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, a very high profile target for the Red Guards. It also didn't help that she was the one who had worked to establish those work teams in Qinghua University that we discussed in the early stages of the Cultural Revolution. So if you remember, Mao had sort of left Liu to try and deal with the sort of posting of all of the big character posters at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. So what he did was send down work teams to universities to try and organise the students, and especially the more conservative students, to try and rein in the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. And his wife was one of the people who led some of these work teams. She probably also rubbed Jiang Qing the wrong way, because although she was Mao's wife, Jiang had been deliberately sidelined in politics since the 1930s, because basically the other members of the Politburo didn't like her. (laughs) And they thought that she was power hungry. She thought that she was, you know, grabbing at politics and things like that. They they basically predicted the future on that one. But yeah, I would have guessed that Jiang Qing didn't like her. But, you know, I haven't read that anywhere. It's just my assumption. 
Anyway, back to Leo. I think I did describe him in a previous episode as a very serious man. He was known to be very organised and practical. And this is probably why he was so dedicated to creating a smooth running and efficient economy. He was very hardworking and by all accounts he was also quite dedicated to Mao personally, even if he didn't always agree with his policies. He always answered Mao's calls at night, no matter what time they came. According to his wife, Liu had supported the initial phases of the Cultural Revolution, believing that there was corruption in the party that had to be dealt with. He actually initially welcomed the opportunity to be criticised, and to allow the masses access to the party. But as things escalated, he became worried, especially as rumours came out that he had been a KMT agent all along. At one point, Liu actually went to see Mao and asked to be able to step down from his position and return either to his home county or to Yan'an and carry out his work in peace. But the chairman only responded that he should study well and keep fit. Apparently, this was one of the last meetings that they had together. Though Liu put himself in the line of fire to try and protect other cadres, he drew the line at being slandered. When an article was released in April 1967, calling him a national betrayer, he apparently threw the paper on the ground, stating, I am not a counter-revolutionary. I never opposed Mao. I was the first to have advocated Mao's thought. His initial wish to be criticised was soon indulged by the Red Guards. He was first criticised in October 1966, for which he prepared a self-criticism. Then he was subjected to a full-blown struggle session on July 18th, 1967, at his residence at the party's headquarters in Zhongnanhai. According to reports, within Zhongnanhai, the internal insurrectionists hauled Liu Xiaoqi and Wang Guangmei to two separate mess halls for struggle. At the same time, they ransacked and confiscated property from the Liu residents, rifling through the hundred-odd notebooks kept by Liu, Wang and their children, hoping to find evidence of crime. At the public accusation meeting, Liu stood bowing at the waist for more than two hours, forbidden to utter a single word. Almost 70 years of age, Liu was tormented until his face turned ashen, covered in beads of perspiration. When he tried to wipe his face with his handkerchief, he was punched by someone standing nearby and lost it. Beads of perspiration dripped to the ground in front of him. After the struggle session, he was marched off to the offices of the front courtyard and kept under surveillance. Wang Guangmei was detained in the back courtyard. The children were kept under watch in their respective rooms. They were unable to contact one another. After that, Wang never saw her husband again. Accused of being a nationalist, working for the Americans, she spent the next 12 years in prison, while Liu was put under house arrest and 400,000 people were employed to go through 4 million files to find dirt on him from the beginning of the communist revolution. Based on their findings, Liu was accused of having completely betrayed the party and the country and was expelled from the party and all his government positions in October 1968. Not long after, Liu contracted pneumonia and his condition quickly deteriorated to the point where he couldn't even get up or eat without assistance. After being transported to Henan to be investigated, Liu died in custody on November 12, 1969. The family were not notified of his death until his children wrote a letter to Mao in 1972 asking to see him. After much to do, Liu's reputation was actually rehabilitated posthumously in 1980, but not until long after Mao had passed away and Deng Xiaoping had managed to wrest power from his opponents. But that's a story for another day. What I think is important to know about the outcome of the Liu Xiaoqi affair is that it was used to show that corruption in the party was an invasion of external forces. So in the documents that they found that they said indicated Liu's egregious errors, Cadres had outlined how Liu had basically infiltrated the party back in the 1920s and that he and his co-conspirators had been traitors and KMT spies all along. By doing this, the Liu Xiaoqi affair was basically able to be used by the party to absolve the party of any blame for misdeeds that had taken place under its rule. Any bribery, embezzlement, mistreatment of the proletariat, debauchery, any kind of immoral act was the fault of the anti-socialists who had been working for the past 30 years to undermine the party from within. There was no inherent corruption. The system in and of itself was fine. 
It was just that a few bad apples that had now been dismissed and dealt with, displaced or destroyed completely by the Red Guards, mass organisations and their counterparts in the countryside, had gone in. But now they were gone. Now the party was free of its biggest poisonous weed, it was free to build itself back up again and become whole once more. The Ninth Party Congress took place in April 1969 and was a similar attempt as the Twelfth Plenum to justify the course of the Cultural Revolution to date, as well as affirm the position of Lim Biao and ratify the new constitution. The new constitution highlighted Mao Zedong's thought as the preeminent guiding principle of the party and the nation, and reintroduced the concept of class background as a determining factor for joining the party. Though class background had been abandoned after the founding of the People's Republic in order to allow the ranks of the party to grow, the possibility that other KMT conspirators and anti-socialists had managed to sneak into the party meant that future infiltration had to be dealt with at the source. Thus, only those of worker, lower or middle peasant and military backgrounds were to be allowed into the party from then on. Ideologically, the new constitution took the nation back to 1966 to the very beginning of the Cultural Revolution, when class background and Mao Zedong thought were everything. But other than on these points, the constitution was rather vague. In the 12 articles, there was nothing on party structure, discipline, or even the day-to-day running of the government. This has been interpreted as a deliberate move to open the way up for a top-down dictatorship of the party by the centre, especially now that over half of the Central Committee – 113 members, to be precise, had been replaced by more junior cadres who had benefited from the Cultural Revolution. Every source that I've read has been very keen to emphasise that while the new Central Committee was filled with less experienced cadres, this was not to say that they were younger cadres. The average age of the new Central Committee was 60, with 45% of them being military members, as opposed to just 19% in 1956. The relative inexperience of the new Central Committee members in matters of domestic and international politics would influence the running of the country over the course of the rest of the Cultural Revolution. This huge turnover reflected the chaos of the previous years, as did the makeup of the new Politburo of the Central Committee, the country's top governing body. The 25 new members of the new Standing Committee were a mix of victims and beneficiaries of the Cultural Revolution. Lim Biao's allies and his detractors, central leaders and regional governors. All in all, while the volatility of the Cultural Revolution was being brought to a close on the ground, up in the political arena, chaos still reigned. Another important thing discussed at the Plenum and the Party Congress was the final move to clear up all the poisonous weeds and basically annoying members of the public who were still trying to keep the chaos of the Cultural Revolution going. The ensuing campaigns, the Cleansing Class Ranks campaign, the One Strike Three Antis and the investigation into the May 16th clique constituted the most violent stage of the Cultural Revolution. Though most people believe that the chaos unleashed by the Red Guards between 1966 and 1968 were the bloodiest period of the decade, it's actually the period 1968 to 1972 where mass violence and military-assisted extermination actually reached their zenith. So let's talk about each of these campaigns in turn and then kind of try and explain how it was that they helped the party restore their own prestige and order to the country. Launched in mid-1968, the Cleansing Class Ranks campaign was aimed at purging the influence of six relatively vague targets from the party once and for all. So the six targets were, one, those who had spoken out against Mao and Lin during the Cultural Revolution, two, the black hands who had manipulated others to commit crimes during the Cultural Revolution, three, bad Cultural Revolution leaders within mass organisations who had caused major disruption, particularly in production. Four, hidden counter-revolutionaries that hadn't been discovered to date. Five, criminals who had committed the heinous act of murder. And six, unreformed members of the four bad types, 
landlords, rich peasants, counter-revolutionaries and rotten elements who had managed to somehow cling on during all of the purges. It seems that the major purpose of the campaign was to get rid of anyone who was even thinking about staging another strike or forming yet another mass group. And the six groups of people identified were just vague enough to encompass pretty much every former Red Guard, most mass organisation leaders, as well as your average educated bourgeoisie type, like teachers, who had already been through the ringer in the first stages of the Cultural Revolution. In the countryside, quotas were often set by village leaders in order to meet the national average, meaning that the campaign affected not only the four bad types, but often also their family members and even distant relatives. Again, punishment was inflicted regardless of a person's behaviour or deeds before the Cultural Revolution. What mattered now was how the Cultural Revolution was going to be conducted from here on out. In the cities, the Cleansing Class Ranks campaign was extremely systematic. It also had the highest death toll of any of the campaigns conducted to ferret out enemies of the state during the Cultural Revolution. Many cases of wrongdoing were falsified, and the use of government-sanctioned mass violence, like we saw at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, became even more intense. In Shanghai, 169,000 people were investigated, and 5,000 people died as a result, either through murder, torture, or suicide. The majority of high- and low-level cadres were investigated, as well as workers, especially those who had done well and risen up during the early stages of the Cultural Revolution. Leaders of mass organisations and newly formed revolutionary committees had their newfound prestige and power stripped away, as their misdeeds during the Cultural Revolution, or their bad conduct of work and in their private lives, was laid bare. They now found themselves targeted by the same cow demons and snake spirits they themselves had accused in the early parts of the Cultural Revolution, an irony that I'm sure wasn't lost on most of them. Among 300,000 textile workers and 40,000 handicraft workers, 14,000 and 4,500 class enemies, respectively, were found by November 1968. As the leader of Shanghai's Workers' General Headquarters, Wang Hongwen stated, quote, The number of factory workers ferreted out in the last two months was greater than in the entire previous two years. In Beijing, 68,000 class enemies were identified in struggle sessions, and between July and August 1968, 430 were beaten to death. By February 1969, a total of 99,000 class enemies had been ferreted out, and according to official statistics, 9,804 people were tortured to death or forced to commit suicide. In general, the average death toll in each of the 2,000 counties in China during this campaign was above 100. In total, 30 million people were targeted, and up to 1.5 million people died due to violence or suicide. The Cleansing Class Ranks campaign became so broad that it eventually encompassed the mass organisations still active in areas like Guangdong and Guangxi that were still engaged in factional fighting. The cleansing was usually led by the new revolutionary committees and assisted by the military, and they usually targeted two types of people. So they either went after these sort of traditional class enemies, you know, like the landlords and rich peasants and those people, or they were targeting people who they felt had committed political crimes. In Guangdong, the average death toll across six counties exceeded 1,000. But the situation was much worse in Guangxi. Eight companies of armed troops in the Guangxi military district had gained approval to suppress their rival mass faction by claiming that they were a counter-revolutionary force determined to stop the formation of the new revolutionary committees. 108 civilians were killed, and many members of the rival faction were tortured. Another group, called the Army of Patriots, which were also based throughout Guangxi, were also identified by the military as an anti-communist group, and a violent suppression of that group was launched right at the beginning of the Cleansing Ranks campaign. In Nanning City, a total of 3,547 members of the Army of Patriots were tortured into confessing their political crimes, and 71 people were killed or forced to commit suicide. In another district, almost 10,000 people were subjected to struggle sessions, and 1,000 of them were beaten to death. 2,000 were abused to the point of permanent disability. 
In another county, the newly established Revolutionary Committee held 11 mass rallies to denounce the Army of Patriots. In the process, 1,500 suspects and other class enemies perished, and 698 were killed during the rallies. It's estimated that at least 100,000 people were killed in Guangxi province alone. On top of the violence, including torture, beatings and mass murder, for some reason a wave of cannibalism also took hold during this period, with at least 10 to 20,000 members of different mobs and militia participating across Guangxi province. So what tended to happen was that after victims were beaten to death, their hearts, livers and even their flesh would be consumed by the killers, with one county reporting that out of 500 people killed, 100 of them were then eaten. The eating didn't just occur in the spur of the moment either. Sorry, I really don't know how to phrase that. So often there were huge feasts that were held where the flesh of the victims was cooked and distributed amongst the community. So some people have labelled this sort of state-sponsored cannibalism, And a number of possible reasons have been offered as to why it even occurred in the first place, from the fact that people felt that it made them more revolutionary, to the idea that they felt that eating the flesh of others would help them extend their own lives, so there was sort of like a mystical element to it. They definitely weren't starving, it wasn't like during the Great Leap Forward period, where there was cannibalism, but not that it was more justified, but you could understand why it was happening. But it seems a lot of the cannibalism that happened was done in secret. The central government didn't actually know about it. And then it was covered up after the Cultural Revolution had come to an end. According to one article, quote, Some of those reportedly involved in cannibalism received minor punishments when the Cultural Revolution ended. In Wuxuan County, where the worst of it took place, 91 people were expelled from the Communist Party for having eaten human flesh, and 39 non-members were demoted or had their wages cut, but apparently no one faced criminal prosecution. So whether it was motivated by personal desire or political fervour or just, you know, mass frenzy, the massacre and the cannibalism in Guangxi is no doubt the darkest and most gruesome chapter of the story of the Cultural Revolution. But unfortunately, it didn't stop there. The witch hunt continued with the One Strike Three Anti campaign, which was carried out mainly in 1970 and continued until 1972 in some areas like Shanghai. Ostensibly a campaign to counter the three types of corruption, embezzlement, profiteering and extravagance, it took on a similar colour to the Cleansing Ranks campaign in that targets for attack were so vague that basically anyone could end up a victim. Although the campaign was supposed to improve industrial production, which had failed to reach its targets because of the disruption caused by the Cultural Revolution, ironically the campaign actually ended up doing the opposite, as it was often carried out in waves, which meant that different people were targeted at different times over the course of two years, so the disruption just sort of kept happening in cycles over and over again. And again, the sheer number of people that were targeted was just enormous. In Hunan province, for example, in 1970, over 24,000 counter-revolutionaries were investigated and tried. The campaign also sort of combined financial crimes with political ones, again, upping the number of people who were targeted. So in Shanghai, demobilised Red Guards who had been sent to factories and who sort of wanted to remain activists but ended up clashing with their more conservative peers, ended up falling on the wrong side of the workers' general headquarters. So 130,000 of these activists ended up being accused of economic crimes and 30,000 of them of counter-revolutionary crimes. Again, things such as personal mistakes, interpersonal grievances and perceived behaviour since the beginning of the Cultural Revolution were all taken into consideration during the campaign. The high-level worker rebel leadership were especially affected. Around 40% of new worker cadres were impacted in some way. In total, about an eighth of the population of Shanghai was persecuted, and around 1,600 people died in the city as a result of the campaign. One particular side effect of both of these two campaigns, the cleansing class ranks and the one strike three antis, was that the mass organisations were severely weakened, particularly in urban areas, and particularly those run by workers. It's difficult to know whether or not this was deliberate. 
As I mentioned, production had been disrupted, which was a huge problem from the standpoint of China's five-year plan system, as well as Mao's general plan for the modernization of the country. Workers were probably also getting a little bit too political for the party's liking, which is evidenced in the fact that many of the victims of these campaigns were those who had actually benefited in the first stages of the Cultural Revolution, when the mass organisations were first being formed. It was the proletariat that was supposed to be led by the party, not the other way around, despite what the epithet dictatorship of the proletariat might otherwise suggest. The final important campaign from this period was the investigation into the May 16th counter-revolutionary clique. Running from 1971 to 1976, it was actually the longest-running mass campaign of the Cultural Revolution, lasting till its end, and again was supposed to be a movement to find the very last of those anti-party conspirators and opposition to the revolutionary committees that had been hiding in whatever corners and under whatever blankets people hadn't checked yet. Honestly, it's just shocking to me that by this point there was anyone left to persecute, or that anyone had even any energy to carry out yet another witch hunt. But alas, they did. In Jiangsu province, for example, 6,000 people died from severe injuries following various types of torture. Zhou Enlai himself had even led a mission to subject 1,700, or roughly 57% of foreign ministry workers to a struggle session. I could go on and on with all these different statistics, but it's just honestly so exhausting to read about the constant search for the interrogation of, the torturing and the killing of all of these people. It's so hard to believe as well that so many people could have been denounced, tortured or killed in such a short period of time. But that was just the nature of the period, I guess. It seems very much like you either had to be looking for an enemy or you would be accused of being one. If you stood still for too long, people would become suspicious. Thus, it seems as if the entire country was in a state of perpetual motion for the entire 10-year period. And it seems as if the party was kind of doing it, or Mao was kind of doing it, to keep people on their toes and to stop them from seeing what was really going on, especially at the higher levels. There were people who were able to avoid the worst of the chaos, obviously, and we'll talk about that in a couple of episodes' time. But from the figures that we've just discussed, we can see that such a huge portion of the population was directly targeted in these campaigns that there couldn't possibly have been a single person who remained completely untouched by them, whether they played the role of oppressed, oppressor, or simply a bystander. So, finally, what do these events, the high-level party meetings, the mass campaigns, the endless deaths and tortures, what do they tell us about the Cultural Revolution? That its impact was shallow and short-lived? Well, according to national official statistics, about 100 million people, or a tenth of the country's population, suffered during the Cultural Revolution. As we'll see in later episodes, the damage done during the Cultural Revolution was deep and long-lasting. Even if there wasn't a huge impact on the state, it was certainly felt on the ground in society. What about that things that it said that it was trying to fix weren't the true aims of the movement? When Mao launched the Cultural Revolution, he claimed that there were demons within the party who were trying to destroy it. In a way, he was correct, if Chinese socialism in the 1960s can be summarised as the anti-capitalist economic policies and adherence to Maoist reforms that Mao would have liked it to be. Those who hesitated to embrace Mao Zedong thought, as well as those who were a threat to Mao's plans to transform the country into a nation of sprawling rural communes and urban industrial centres, were replaced. But was that really what the movement said it was trying to fix? And what about the idea that took hold in China itself, that the people, in the end, don't really have any power? Well, if the Cultural Revolution taught us anything, it's that the people did have power, but the problem was that they weren't able to wield it freely. It was almost as if they were stopped before they could really get going, that just as the Cultural Revolution was about to reach a critical climax, its head was cut off. In the end, we'll never really know just how powerful the hundreds of millions of Chinese individuals could be when joining together to overturn an overbearing government, mainly because they were often just found fighting among themselves. Perhaps the true lesson of the Cultural Revolution is that China is a one-party state, 
and one of the aims of the party is its own self-perpetuation. It exists partly so that it can keep on existing, and it brooks no opposition to this aim. This is why the idea that the Cultural Revolution was a revolution against the party is being critiqued more and more these days. Besides, it's much more believable that it was just a power grab by Mao, as we discussed in episodes leading up to the Cultural Revolution, and in the first episode on why the Cultural Revolution had been launched. In the end, Mao was fearful that his own position was being threatened, and he was even willing to turn the logic of the Cultural Revolution on its head on multiple occasions in order to achieve his aims. The May 16th Circular on the Cultural Revolution, which was distributed to every party committee at every level of the country, contains the following statement. Everyone is equal before the truth. This is a bourgeois slogan. Completely negating the class nature of truth, they use this slogan to protect the bourgeoisie and oppose the proletariat, oppose Marxism-Leninism, and oppose Mao Zedong thought. In the struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, between the truth of Marxism and the fallacies of the bourgeoisie and all other exploiting classes, either the East Wind prevails over the West Wind, or the West Wind prevails over the East Wind. There is absolutely no such thing as equality. The point of the Cultural Revolution was never to bring the party in line with the masses, nor was it to grant the masses the power to oversee the party. It was launched in order to anoint Mao as the holder of absolute truth, enshrined within his Mao Zedong thought. The objective truth didn't matter. What mattered was who was speaking. As a quote from the beginning of this episode showed, from the perspective of the people, nothing had really changed. But at the same time, everything had changed. People had learned that a true Marxist revolution, led by the proletariat from the bottom up, was not possible in China. The party was forever, and the bureaucracy was basically unassailable. Even if they got rid of bad individuals, those individuals would just be replaced by new people, and the actual structure would remain the same. Those who were left to jostle for their own position in a post-violent world must have wondered, thinking back on all the infighting, the persecution, the death and destruction, Was it all worth it? Well, maybe there's another side to the story. As we move into the post-1969 period, a new question emerges. Was the Cultural Revolution all about destruction, or did anything new, anything good, come out of it? In his book The Battle for China's Past, Gao Mobo writes the following. Many would argue, however, that while the first two years of chaos and destruction have been highlighted by the Cold War warriors and neoliberals alike, the positive and constructive years from 1969 to the early 1970s have been forgotten or obscured. These positive legacies include a massive infrastructure programme, radical education reforms, innovative experimentation in literature and the arts, expansion of healthcare and education in rural areas, and rapid development of rural enterprises. The Cultural Revolution involved many millions of people who willingly participated in what they saw as a movement to better Chinese society and humanity in general. A whole range of ideas and issues from politics to education and healthcare, from literature and the arts to industrial and agricultural policies were examined, tried and tested. Our present mindset, politics and even geographical location tend to heavily influence our perceptions of the past. This is something that I've learned from being a historian. The author that I just quoted, and other authors similar to him, challenge us to think. Was the Cultural Revolution really 10 years of catastrophe, or were there positive aspects that are consistently glossed over in the interests of preserving the current cultural hegemony and developmental trends, particularly in post-Mao China, where it's all hell-bent on economic growth and political unity? Perhaps the Cultural Revolution should be understood as a broader reflection of China under Mao, While there were many who suffered and became victims, there were also many who benefited greatly and whose fortunes were completely transformed. Many people lived good lives and were able to progress in new careers. Not only did not all Chinese people suffer, but it's very important for us to remember that for those who did suffer, the inflictors of their suffering were their fellow countrymen, not some outside invader. Often they were their neighbours, people they knew. Hell, sometimes they were even their own children. 
How the Cultural Revolution can be seen through different lenses is a really important question, and it's one that we will be exploring in the series, but not quite yet. And that's because before we move on to the next stage, talking about education and economics in the countryside and whatever, there's one really important question that we have to answer. It's my favourite question when it comes to the Cultural Revolution, and that question is, what happened to Lin Biao? But for now, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget that this podcast also has a newsletter. You can subscribe by going to the Sinobabble website and filling in your details, or heading over to Substack and searching for Sinobabble. A couple of teachers have let me know that they use the YouTube videos of this podcast to help with their lessons. There isn't any video with them, but it just helps them integrate it better. So if you're a teacher, you want to use the YouTube videos, search for Sinobabble on YouTube. We're not all caught up yet, but over time, we're going to get there. You can also donate to support the podcast by going to sinobabble.com and clicking on the donate button. You can make a one-off or monthly contribution. Any amount at all is much appreciated. Please also leave a review for this podcast if you're listening on a player that allows you to do so. Spotify, Apple, whatever. And finally, if you have Twitter, please follow me there at Sinobabble. That's it. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you tune in to the next episode.